For a nation at war, new recruits are vital assets that must be closely guarded. After all, you can't keep an army in fighting shape without replacing battle casualties. But some of the fighting nations of the Second World War didn't see things this way, putting their recruits through absolute hell. In today's front episode, we run through the worst basic training programs that unlucky recruits could find themselves in. You'd expect elite British forces like the Special Air Service and Parachute Regiment to lose recruits during training, and sometimes they did. But there was a third aerial force that lost far more recruits in training accidents than either of them, the Glider Pilot Regiment. Parachuting soldiers onto an objective was pretty hit or miss during the Second World War. Airborne soldiers were often scattered over a vast area and many lost their equipment as soon as they were out of the plane. One solution to this problem was gliderborne troops. A platoon of soldiers packed into a plane with no engines would be towed in range of its target by another aircraft. The tug plane would detach when they got close and the glider could fly silently to its target, where it would crash land and deploy the troops. It wasn't such a terrible idea, except for one thing. To maximize the element of surprise, pilots would crash pretty much on top of their objective. These objectives were usually command bunkers or gun emplacements, not airfields. Top brass knew this, so they incorporated it into the glider pilot's training program. Well, it makes sense from the general's perspective, until you realize they were ordering novice pilots to crash a plane into a building or crash land as close as they could to one. Surprising no one, casualties in training were obscene. A visiting US Air Force observer noted, the British glider troops training camp nearby appeared wasteful of human life to the point of disregard. Few days passed, it seemed, that a flag draped coffin escorted by troopers in red berets did not rumble by on the way to the British Army Cemetery. But the Americans couldn't be too disparaging about British deaths in training because they weren't much better. In fact, their aircrew death rate was a whole lot worse. In 1941, the United States began gearing up for war and that meant they needed both planes and people to crew them. New designs were rushed through production and aircraft were often leaving factories without proper testing. The worst of these rush job planes was the B-24 Liberator, which air crews dubbed the Flying Coffin. Despite a growing heap of mechanical issues, Top Brass decided to make the B-24 the USAAF's primary heavy bomber. It got the job done, but it could be a death trap for its crew. Between 1942 and 1945, B-24s had 1,713 accidents, killing 2,796 air crewmen. But when you look at the big picture, things actually get worse. During the Second World War, 15,000 USAAF airmen were killed in training accidents in the continental United States. The main culprit was mechanical failures which commonly locked up pilot controls and killed the engines. Faults with electrical wiring were common too, and these meant a pilot had to deal with an onboard fire while trying to fly the plane. It might surprise you, but these accidents were by far the biggest killer of USAAF personnel. Of the 65,164 planes lost by the USAAF during the war, 42,216 65% were lost in accidents and not in combat. They may not have had to contend with the harshest discipline or the toughest conditions, but the USAAF air crews faced something much worse. A legitimate chance of death every time they got behind their aircraft's controls. In 
And this was all before they even caught sight of the enemy. Before we get to the absolute worst basic training in World War II, we've got a few honorable mentions. First up is the Soviet 161st Rifle Division, which fought at Smolensk from August 1941. Standard Soviet infantry training was supposed to last three months, and despite what the war movies show, it nearly always did. Rare were the occasions when recruits would be given rifles and thrown straight into the cacophony of battle. But it did happen, in one case to recruit Ivan Shelepov of the 161st Rifle Division. He had been conscripted from his workplace in late August and sent to basic training. But before he'd been there two weeks, the Germans made a major breakthrough near Smolensk. Hundreds of thousands of Soviet soldiers were encircled and facing annihilation at the hands of the Wehrmacht. Emergency troops were desperately needed, so Shelopov and the other recruits were piled into a train and sent to the front. They were thrown into a frontal assault the next morning and took horrendous casualties. A dislocated ankle saved Shelopov's life, and he later remarked, It was quite a feeling. Just an hour ago, I was a civilian, and now I have a rifle in my hands. I knew war was scary, but I could never imagine such an all-embracing horror. It is impossible to describe. A year earlier, another nation faced the same problem. The Luftwaffe had become a regular feature in British skies by August 1940, and the RAF was cutting corners everywhere it could to churn out fighter pilots for the Battle of Britain. Pilot training was split into three phases, basic, advanced, and combat, with pilots spending four to six weeks at each stage. This worked fine at the basic stage, where novice pilots learned to fly in pre-war training craft. The problems lay with advanced and combat training. Very few experienced instructors were available as frontline squadrons needed as many capable men as they could get. For the same reason, Spitfires and Hurricanes were also reserved for these units. The final nail in the coffin was the British weather, which is famous for being awful. When combined, these factors meant that many new pilots went to their squadrons in this critical stage of the battle with virtually no experience in their warplanes. While it's not the worst training regime by far, any training has got to be better than none at all. But there was one nation where basic training was so brutal that its consequences can still be felt today. This dubious honor, of course, goes to Imperial Japan. While every other nation trained its soldiers to fight, Imperial Japan was training its men to die. It was all part of the Yamato Damashi, the Japanese martial spirit the government was obsessed with. Soldiers were taught that any order given by an officer was the divine will of the emperor. To question divine will was basically treason, and if the sergeant heard, it could get a soldier killed. Army officers tended to believe their soldiers were, at heart, undisciplined brutes who only understood violence. In training, beatings were handed out liberally, often for the tiniest of infractions. Non-commissioned officers would sometimes order their recruits to beat each other to near death. These sadists often got carried away and it wasn't uncommon for a recruit to be beaten until he died. But the worst part was that these beatings never stopped. In the field, Japanese veterans were often beaten until they were incapacitated by newly minted officers looking to make a name for themselves. Even General Tojo, the head of the Japanese army, beat his subordinates when he felt they weren't up to scratch. For the soldiers at the bottom of the pile, it was hell. Anything short of fanatical loyalty to those in senior positions could easily result in broken bones and ruptured organs. They were treated like absolute animals, and when they were let off the leash in occupied areas, that's exactly how they treated the local civilians. The infamously barbaric way Japanese soldiers treated recently captured POWs mirrored their own treatment in basic training. Brutalized from day one, these soldiers had it in them to commit the worst atrocities of the war, but there's still no excusing what they did. 
Those were stories from the absolute worst basic training programs of the Second World War. But what do you think? Would you have signed up to the USAAF knowing the risks? How would you feel if you were rushed from training to the front line after just two weeks of basics? Were you aware of just how brutal army training was in Imperial Japan? Let us know all that and more in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.